I hate that term, especially the Cornette fans. This isn't wrestling. Mm. Why isn't it? Undertaker struck a man with a lightning bolt. Kane shot a man with a fireball. So this interview with Sammy Callahan was recorded back in the days before the term social distancing existed. Yeah, this was back in the day when you could sit in the same room as someone, shake their hand, imagine doing that now, look them in the eye, and have a chat with them. Although I appreciate you guys watching the live Q&As that we've been having. They've been fun. But since the quarantine started, I've been spending so much more time on my phone. My screen time is through the roof. I'm sure yours is too. In fact, you're probably watching this on your phone right now. And I've spent so much time on my phone browsing Grailed. And shout out to them for sponsoring this video. Grailed is the largest marketplace for men's fashion, streetwear, and sneakers. Grailed makes great clothing affordable and available to everyone because they have the deepest catalog of men's luxury streetwear, designer, and archival fashion online. So whatever brand it is that you choose, whether it's Gucci, Supreme, Nike, Saint Laurent, whatever it is, Grailed has you covered. They've always got it in stock and they've always got it at the best price. Or maybe you're looking to clean out your closet. Maybe you're looking to turn those clothes into some a cold, a hard a cash. Well, these are young bucks, but you get the point. Buying and selling has never been easier with Grailed and they will completely change the way that you buy and sell your clothes. I'm on Grailed. You've probably seen some of those styles if you follow me on Instagram, at Chris Van Vliet. In fact, you can check out a curated shopping list with some of my favorite items by clicking the link down below in the description. And while you're there, get yourself signed up for a Grail account and get yourself looking good. Let me know what some of your favorite items are down below in the comments. Now let's get to it. An in-person conversation where we could actually shake hands with each other. It's one-on-one -on -one with Sammy Callahan. Look how well dressed you are. I don't know what to do with my hands. Uh, I think you need to hold the microphone as uh... You're like the only interviewer that has custom microphones. <laughs> I feel like that's why your channel has so many subscribers. Because I have a microphone. It's the production value. He's like, yo, this dude has a little flag for the microphone. So when people Real are deal. when people are watching my channel, they go, who's who's interviews? Oh, it's Chris Van Vliet. Do people mess up your name a lot? All the time. You got to talk into the microphone if you're going to. Oh, I didn't yeah. know it was an actual microphone. Yeah, of course it's an actual I thought it was microphone. a prop. <laughs> yes, my name gets messed up. All the time. I'd feel like some people try to say it like filet, but like with yeah. a V. Yeah, filet. I get that. Or like I'm from Canada. They're like, oh, so your last name's French. I had no clue you're from Canada. Oh. We cannot do this interview anymore. Oh, well, there you go. See you later. Canada is like a really shitty apartment over a really, really good party. How dare you? Wow. You, you can't say anything fun happens in Canada. Hockey's pretty good. I mean, hockey's good in the United States, too. They invented basketball in Canada. What is the best in the United States? Beer. Canadian beer? I'm a big proponent of the United States. I, I like America, too. Look, I, I'm not a Trump supporter at all, but I do love America. Like, people will bitch and complain about our country more than ever, but at the end of the day, no one wants to leave. No. I, and there's no, a reason look, for that. I've lived here for 10 years now, and I have zero complaints. I, I enjoy living here. and I Everything's open 24 hours a day, pretty much. When, <laughs> when I travel the world... And you go to another country, you go to yeah, Germany, England, yeah. Scotland, everything closes at 7 p.m. And you're like, well, I'm not eating tonight. <laughs> That's so true. That, and also when you come to America and you get like the lunch size portion of something and it's like seven plates. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, my God. Like, am I feeding a small family? And then you feel like a big fat ass when you go to the, the UK. You're like, oh, yeah, let me get uh, the medium. And then the medium is like our ch children's size. <laughs> America, yeah. <laughs> oh, fat people. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't say that. Hey, he's making fun of America. I just said, he America! Said you like my new little hat? I, I just caught a glimpse of it in the camera, so I always wear the bent bill redneck ball yeah, cap, yeah. but you know what? I feel like going to train to conductor hats from now on. It's a new from phase of my on? life. It might be a new thing forever. You've, you've dressed very well here. I feel very underdressed. I know. Sometimes you got to dress up, and I felt like today was the day. You've got a collar. You've I got do. a vest. I do. Oh, it's a Burlington Coat Factory. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Burlington <laughs> Coat Factory. It's really sad that I have money, and I still will not spend money on clothing. I, I But I feel you, though. Like There's something about going to a Burlington Coat Factory, a TJ Maxx, gotta find the deals. a Marshalls, and you're like, my God, this shirt was only $14. Yeah, I own four pairs of pants. That's it. That's it. That's all you really Is need. Is that including wrestling pants? 
No, that does not include wrestling pants. I have, I have more wrestling pants than I have actual pairs of pants. I, well, I would kind of expect that, I think. Obviously. Yeah. I have two belts. I feel like I should. Oh, sorry. Like, I guess in the wrestling world, we think of belts as being like. Yeah, I lost that shit. I don't have that right now. So, I mean, like, good old fashioned leather belts to hold my britches up. <laughs> but, britches, is that a word in Canada? That's something my dad said all the time. You, yeah. Come on, pull your britches up. Yeah, I, I guess so. I guess that's an old person thing, I guess. Well, I said, I guess I'm an old person. Thanks a lot. It's the, tra- it's the train conductor hat. You jerk. Uh, yeah, it's so. Awkward. You, and we'll approach another awkward subject here of you not being the champion anymore. That shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's especially with especially with Impact Wrestling. I am a guy that, honestly, I don't need the Impact Championship. I made the Impact Championship more than the Impact Championship made me. Uh, I think my track record speaks for itself at this point. Two-time match of the year, two-time moment of the year. Anything I do at Impact Wrestling is going to be the main event, whether I have the championship or not. You've really found a home in Impact Wrestling. I did. They're the first company to actually pull all the shackles off and go, do you? Because obviously, there's something weird about you that's correct. (laughs) Is this, you know, Sammy in real life too, weird? Oh, 100%. (laughs) I am an oddball. I got really excited the other day because I bought a new couch and it reclines and it has recliners in it. Sounds great. Amazing. I yeah. don't want to leave my house ever again. <laughs> but you've been in you know, Ring of Honor. You've been in NXT. Why is it that Impact Wrestling? New Japan. Yeah, New Japan. Uh, Underground. I've MLW. Wrestled for every major yes, company I know. on the planet. Right. Much. Why is I mean, it? I'll put myself over. This interview is about me. Of I've course it is. Everywhere. Hell, right now we're in Samstown Casino. I'm going to take credit for that and say that's pretty much my casino, too, at this point. I mean, you have. It's named after me, Samstown. Why yeah, is it that Impact Wrestling has been this great fit for you? Uh, I think it's one of the things, like, I wanted to see Impact Wrestling do better because I was such a big fan of Impact mm-hmm. Wrestling, of TNA when I was younger and coming up in the wrestling business. I was like, yo, like, I want to wrestle for TNA back in the days. AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, all these guys. Yeah. And when Impact was at its worst, I really could have went back to NXT probably. I could have tried to continue to go to New Japan more after a tour of New Japan, but came to Impact Wrestling because there's something I want on my resume that no other company can give me. I want to be one of the people that help save Impact Wrestling because that's something no one can ever take away from you, and that looks better than a world championship on your resume at the end of the day. Right. So, I mean, what are you doing as Sammy Callahan to help kind of – revitalize impact wrestling i think it's one of those things i'm not afraid to offend people i'm not afraid to upset people i'm one of the only quote unquote heels in the business i don't give a shit if someone gets all offended and upset like in today's world of cancel culture you have to be careful what you do as a pro wrestler on television and you got to be careful what you do as a pro wrestler in real life yeah and I'm one of the rare people that I walk that fine line and I give everyone a reason or something to hate. And we were talking about this earlier. I'm a guy, there's no middle ground with me. You either love me or you absolutely hate me. Yeah. Well, and, and with you walking that fine line, you've done some controversial things, both 100%. in the ring and outside of the ring. I'm a five foot eight white kid at the end of the day from Ohio. I had to do something to make myself stand out because just looking at me, you might be like, oh, that dude's not that intimidating. But then when you go behind the layers, behind the layers, behind the layers, behind the layers, there's so much more to the character of Sammy Callahan than there is a lot of other characters in professional wrestling. You are pretty, I, I think you are very intimidating, though. Like an onion. Peel off the layers. Yeah. Yeah, you are very intimidating, though, because like, Sure, you might only be five foot eight, but like you have this like crazy intensity about you. Because I've been in real fights in real life. That's that's one of the things I think today's generation, not of them have actually had their ass kicked and know what that feels like, knows what it's like to be in that sense of peril and actually be in that situation. I've been in that situation. I've had my ass kicked way too many times when I was younger. And that's why I think it's something that doesn't really scare me at this point. Were you like a shit disturber? And I was not a shit disturber. I just ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, I've never been in the back of a cop car. Okay. Ever. I've never been arrested. I've never been in the back of the cop car. I have a pretty squeaky clean record. But just lots of fights. Lots of fights. Well, where I came, I came up in Ohio, like it was just a bunch of redneck dumbasses trying to fight each other <laughs> or anything. And I just wander into the wrong thing. You looking at my cow? You looking at him? That's not an Ohio accent. That, that, hey, you don't know where I'm from in Ohio. It just turned into <laughs> Ohio. Welcome to Ohio. Aren't you from like the Dayton ish area? No, I live in Dayton now. I am from the Bell Fountain area, which is Logan County, Ohio, which we have three little towns in Logan County. And 
one area is very white trash trailer park one area is very farm country one area is the city and through a span of 18 years as an adolescent i had spent time in each of the different districts lived in one district and I was a rich kid. Then my parents went bankrupt when my mom got real sick. Then we moved into the trailer park district. And then we worked our way back up from that. Then we moved to another district. Like we lived in every district at some point in my life. And at what point was it like was wrestling your escape from this? Always. Hmm. Since day one. That's like like people say, oh, wrestling was my second or third choice. Wrestling was my only choice. My entire I dropped out of film school to like continue to be a pro wrestler. Everything I ever did from sports to show choir to drama to anything I ever did as an adolescent was because I thought it would help me as a professional wrestler. Show choir. Dude, I was in a badass show choir. You don't even want to know. Hold on. I'll get you pictures. You were a singer? I was a tenor. <laughs> we, are learning, we are learning so much. I ain't afraid. Because there's something about a dude that can sing tenor that will beat your can ass. Can you sing That's a little for us? I ain't singing for you. <laughs> I don't think I could sing anymore. My vocal cords. People ask me, oh, like he must smoke a lot. I do not smoke at all. My parents died of lung cancer. I'm not going to smoke cigarettes. Uh, no, my vocal cords are messed up from screaming years after years after years of pro wrestling. There's times where I get done from a weekend of wrestling where I don't have my voice for four days. Oh, I believe that. Because I'm a, I'm a big screamer. I yeah. I like to scream. Yeah. Very I, loud. I remember one of, the f one of the first indie shows I ever saw you wrestle at. You would, you would just be like, wrestling! I do shit to pop myself all the time. It was so great. And it pops me. It probably popped you. It works. That's the thing. Yeah. It popped the crowd big time. My entire wrestling career, a lot of it's been built off things that I think's extremely funny and trying to do them in a weird way that other people don't think they're funny. They don't know the, the true meaning behind something I did. Like, there was a whole era of Impact Wrestling with OVE last year where I think there was like 10 or 15 promos where me and Jake Chris dropped ding a -ling. And every promo, <laughs> instead of saying dick, instead of pe saying penis, we dropped dang because we thought it was the funniest thing ever. Have you ever tried something that you thought was funny and then just completely fell flat? Oh, 100%. Like, pro wrestling is really like being a stand-up comedian. Sometimes you'll try material that you're like, this is going to get them. And then it's just crickets, and you feel like a dumbass, and you just stand there. And that's when you yell wrestling really loud. <laughs> but then you're like, that, that thing's catching on? Like, Oh, dude, the, like the thumbs up, thumbs down thing, I couldn't believe how much that picked on. That just started yeah. as a joke at first, and that built up, and now it's like 90% of my character. Right. And you're kind of working, you know, on, on a bit of a new character now. Like, we didn't see you for a while, yeah. and now you're back. Yeah, 100%. Like, I, not to kiss his ass or anything, but if you really look at my career, a lot of my career, like, the, the blueprint of it is off of a guy like Chris Jericho. Jer Jericho truly is one of the best of all times. Yeah. But one of the reasons he has such staying power is because every couple of years, he reinvents himself and makes himself special or does something controversial to get himself buzzed. If you look at Chris Jericho from 1997, he's a way different Chris Jericho than he is now. And he for wasn't sure. afraid to disappear off television for six months just to reinvent his character and come back and get that pop. He's always done that from the time where – he was the best in the world at what he did to the time where he was pretty much the Ayatollah of rock and roll. He's a rock star to now being rock and roll dad. Like there's, there's different <laughs> echelons of what he's done. And I yeah. think he is a great exoskeleton of what you should want to become as a pro wrestler, especially if you're a lifer. And he told me that he modeled that after David Bowie. Yeah. Who was constantly reinventing himself. I didn't think of it like that, but that's 100%. Like, David Bowie is not the same David Bowie that was in The Labyrinth <laughs> as he as he transferred. Yes. Even now, like, him in his nice, like, posh suits, like, dressed yeah. like he should be a secret agent in a... <laughs> In a 007 movie. Yeah, Jericho said that he modeled his career after David Bowie. You're now, you know, saying that Jericho's the model that everyone should be kind of looking at. 100%. I know he works for a different company, but, like, it, it's one of those things that he is a, at this point, he's a, a living legend in professional wrestling. Oh, for sure. Doesn't and matter he's still, what And he's still at the top of his game, which is the craziest. The older he gets, he somehow gets better, which is usually the complete opposite. So you're, you're, you're coming off being the champion. You, you drop the championship to Tessa, and then you basically disappear. Was Impact okay with this idea? Not at first. It was something I think I was originally only supposed to be gone for two shows, and then I was just supposed to come back, attack someone, do the same shit that I've been doing for years. I was like, no. Like, honestly, like, I begged them when we were down in Mexico. I was like, you Yo, I have this idea of something that I've been wanting to do for years. I think it could really be something special. But if we're going to do it, I have to be off TV for like six to eight weeks. Mm. 
And they at first they're like, how are we going to take one of our top guys? How can we justify to the office and justify to investors and everyone else taking one of their top guys off television when he's not injured for excess of eight television shows? Right. And it was something I had to meticulously like beg and write down. I had a lot of the right people behind me on it that we were ended up able to talk people into like what this character was exactly going to be. And I think it's only going to blow up more than it has already. And I feel like this is kind of kind of like the character you did in NXT. Yeah, but done the correct way. Uh, and that's not shitting on WWE at this point. That's just they did not understand it at all. And I think it was a little bit before its time. Uh, we really didn't even get to pull the trigger on the the hacker uh, cyberpunk character really at all. It was something that me and Dusty Rhodes had like really written out and came up with ideas. Uh, and it was something that I'd came up with from being a big video game nerd and like actually watching the movie Hackers, uh, which I think, what, what year did that come out? Like 92, oh, my, 93? Yeah. Man, that's an like, old film. I still remember to this day, my dad who was born in the late forties. So like my dad was a complete different generation than us. I remember watching that movie with him as a child and I will remember this memory forever. So I was thinking of ideas for NXT. This is one of the first that I was like, I want to be a different style, like creepy dude. I don't want to just be like the Bray Wyatt or the undertaker style. I want to be something that's completely new age. I was like, what, what, what scared my dad? And then I remember him saying like, as a joke one day, he's like, Oh, everyone thinks Freddy and Jason's scary. You know what's scary? That movie, Hackers. That movie, Hackers, is scary. Like, they could just wipe your whole bank account out. You'd be done. Like, and I still remember this day. Like, and yeah. like that always clicked in my brain. And then seeing the, now especially more than ever, I think this is the perfect time to do it. Seeing how big Black Mirror is on Netflix. Seeing oh, how yeah. big Mr. Robot is. Like, this is something that can completely transcend an entire generation of wrestling fans. So if this was an idea that you had years ago when you were in NXT. I actually had this idea right before I went to NXT and I wanted to do it in Evolve. Okay. And I remember Gabe was like, oh, th this character's dope. You should wait and save it for when you go to NXT. And I went to NXT and I pulled it out. And I remember someone in the office going, why would a hacker wrestle? And I was like, well, why would the Undertaker wrestle? He strikes dude with lightning bolts. Like, I don't think that's really the, the hill to die on. But it just didn't click. I didn't click. Mm. And uh, But now, like... Being able to have the freedom that I have at Impact Wrestling, having my body of work speak for itself. You don't just come into a company and instantly get trust. You don't instantly get to do whatever you want. But yeah. I've built up my body of work. I've built up my trust with this company that they're going to let me think a little bit out of the box. Well, I think you're so much more creative than anyone could ever give you credit for. Uh, people don't know what I do. Like, yeah. I, I And I kind of like it that way. I like people to think – I don't like people to know a lot about my private life. I don't like them to know what I do behind the scenes for different people. Like I run my own company, the wrestling revolver. Yeah. I don't think people even realize that blows up. Some people do, but like yeah. that blows up every year, especially around WrestleMania weekend, pancakes and pile drivers, but guys that I've had hand in directly helping are some of their favorites, the rascals, Ace Austin, Ace Romero, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Like because of revolver, there's been like eight people signed with impact wrestling or just things I've done for different wrestlers that you've even seen on WWE television right now. One of my first projects as a young wrestler was Shane Strickland, who's now uh, Isaiah Swerve Scott, absolutely yeah. killing it. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not the guy to always go out and go, I did this, or I did that, or I did this, or I did that. I don't like to take credit for dumb shit because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. We'll all be buried in a box, and what you did doesn't, <laughs> isn't going to be shit. But I think that you're one of those guys that if you kind of give your approval to someone, other people go, oh, Sammy likes him? Oh, there must yeah, but, be something but it's also him. detrimental to people, I think, at this point. <laughs> because now people want to be like, oh, this, is, this show's just going to be Sammy and friends. Like, uh. Sammy and friends. But I've never been one to politic for myself. I politic for other people. But you can't. You, 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 you can't hate on all of our guys because all of our guys, no matter what show they're on around the country, are the top guys on the show. How has becoming a promoter changed the way that you wrestle? Uh, it, it, I don't think it's really changed the way that I wrestle, but I'm one of the rare promoters. I don't use my promotion to get myself booked other places. I don't use my promotion to further my own career. I use it to build other people, and I do it because I, there's a different kind of gratification out of running a wrestling show or writing an angle or coming up with something that you think's going to work and seeing someone else go out and kill it and do it to a T yeah. and see the crowd react the way you imagine, the way you read it. Uh, if you look at my my record in the Wrestling Revolver, I think I'm – two and 22 because I wanted the entire shtick of my company to be like, Oh, Sammy always loses mm. because usually if a promoter is uh, 
running or has the book, they're like, I'm going to be the champion. Right. Uh, uh, you're coming in and you're, you're going to wrestle me and I'm going to beat you because I'm the, I'm the promoter. I'll, I'll be the first champion and then we'll figure it out from there. Yeah, no, I refuse to allow myself to win a championship with the Wrestling Revolver. Hell, I hate winning matches at Wrestling Revolver. The two matches I've won was all because just storyline purposes. If I didn't win, it would ruin the entire storyline. And it was always in like a, uh, a multi-man match. I think I've won one singles match ever because I beat Matthew Palmer because I, as a joke, I told Palmer, I was like, I ain't putting you over in Dayton. And he's like, he's like, I think I should. I was like, I ain't putting you over in Dayton, bro. And it became a whole joke for weeks that then when we went out there, we didn't even have a finish. And then we were both fighting to put the other person over. Like, no, you win. I was like, no, you win. No, you in win. the ring? In the ring. <laughs> See, and that's what makes wrestling fun. Yeah. Yeah. And but especially in like, society there's so many old timers like oh kayfabe is dead oh kayfabe is dead because people like jim Cornette want to go out and bitch and complain about the wrestling business to everyone to say what's wrong with something instead of enjoying it that's why the wrestling business kayfabe is dead but now there's a different form of kayfabe because now i think it's easier to work fans because people legit think what you say on twitter is real life yeah they don't think that oh this is a character saying this This isn't like if you look at my twitter 95% 95% of the time, I ain't going to say shit about any sort of politics or religion yeah. or talk about me and my girl. Je- like, a lot of people don't even know me and Jessica have, a, have been dating for like eight years because we don't put that out. We're not like, oh, I love you on social media. You yeah. know why? Because our social media is to build our brand. It has nothing to do with real life. Social media isn't real life, and too many people don't realize that. They might see what I say on Twitter. Like, for instance, when the, the entire Eddie Edwards situation happened and I put out something like, we're obviously like, yo, we're going to work the hell out of this and make some money. Uh, and I put something out about like, oh, yeah, I broke Eddie Edwards' face, but my bank account looks the same at the end of the day. <laughs> and people like Chris Hero, who I thought was one of my friends at the time, buried me and said, how dare you bring money into this? And all this, I'm like, how are all these people idiots? They're like, right. I'll break this like I've ever broken. People still think that I hurt Kevin Sullivan, which at the end of the day – what people don't realize is I am a master graphic designer, not put myself over. I Photoshopped that entire picture. Wow. Uh, He had a little Nick on his head because he gigged in the match after getting hit with a chair and he had a little egg. And then he's like, I'll take this picture and post it online. And I was like, and then I Photoshopped it. And I did the same thing when you're a child and you'd like try to make girls boobs bigger, like by putting the inflate thing or like make people's eyes bigger by hitting the inflate. I did that to his head and then post a picture of him half dead. And said, this old man stepped to me. I'm going to beat it. Like he's like, and then like, he he worked into it too because he's old school. He he went on uh, social media and stuff and went on interviews and like buried me and said, "Oh yeah, when we got to the back, like my guys and the the OVE guys got in a fight and the cops were called at this building wow. and like he worked it to everyone to the yeah. point that Ric Flair called him and was like, "Yo, we need to bury this dude." And Kevin's like, "Rick, it's a work. Wow, it's a work." So like, I'll, and it, Kevin said many and many and many like old timers had hit him up and like, this kid's dangerous. He hurt Eddie Edwards. He hurt you. And like, like people don't realize I went my entire career without hurting anybody. Yeah. And then you hurt one person and you're, you're public enemy number one because everyone wanted me to apologize to them. Yeah. Like the fans thought they deserved an apology. Like, oh, you got to apologize to us. Like you didn't keep your opponent safe. That's wrong. And that's exactly what's wrong with the business. Why am I going to apologize to the fans? They, they, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you won't. Like, we need wrestlers to quit breaking kayfabe and work their character. Well, I do that and I go on TMZ, but that just makes me public enemy number one and I'm just a piece of shit. Well, what exactly was supposed to happen with this Eddie Edwards spot? Uh, it was a situation we planned it for the show. We had a special chair that we were going to do it with. And then what people don't realize is someone in production, when they're cleaning up the ring, took the chair away. So you had a plastic chair that no, you used. No, we had a metal chair. So you were supposed was, to use a metal yes, chair. Yes, because the metal chair will go over the body. But you ended That's up using the plastic think, oh, chair. That's why people think, oh, he was just careless and used a shitty plastic chair. No, it's because we're fucking, the red light's on. And we're like, we got to do this right now. We have timing. And then it was just a missed time. Like, yeah. you panic. Fucking, we don't have the right thing. We go to do it. We're both moving. We're both going too fast. Shit happens. And we, me and Eddie Edwards both, uh, I don't like people to really know about what has been said personally. But one thing that is is a, a common comparison that both of us will always think is that was the best thing that ever happened in both of our careers. Mm-hmm. Because Eddie Edwards was a guy like not shitting on Dean Malenko. He's one of the best of all time, but Dean Malenko as a technical wrestler had to go out there every night and be Dean Malenko. Yeah. 
Like that gets hard after a while. That gets tired after a while. It's like everyone expects you to go out and be the best technical wrestler in the world. And like Eddie had kind of fill, fallen into that. It's like, oh, Eddie's one of the best technical wrestlers in the world. He had to have the same matches and do the same stuff over and over. And him getting his orbital bone broke allowed him to go a completely different path of what he was planned on doing. Yeah. And now we have the Eddie Edwards of now, which questionably I think is one of the best Eddie Edwards of like all time in his whole career, like because it's different and it's real and it gave him a different yeah. realness about him that completely changed his career for the better. Yeah, he's actually said that that in a weird way, that incident help could have helped his career more than anything else. 100%. Because he would have, like you said, just keep, kept being the same guy. And exactly. Wouldn't have had a, a need to change. He might have got, but, but even as... Him in his head, like doing the same thing for years upon years upon years, that might make you forget you love the wrestling business. That might make you think like, oh, this is getting boring. Mm. Like, this is the same old shit day after day. And not saying anything he did is shit. He's awesome. Like, people, Eddie Edwards truly is the undertaker of the Impact Wrestling locker room. Like, he's the guy. He's the dad. He's the guy everyone looks up to. Like, if Eddie has a problem, everyone else is going to have a problem. Mm. And Eddie's the one of the only guys that he'll, like, never push his own agendas. He's always there for other people. But, like, if you mess up, like, if you truly mess up, he's going to be someone to say something. Because, you know, Eddie doesn't say shit a lot. But if he says something, there's a damn good reason for mm. it. So you were supposed to hit the bat onto the, like, the seated part of the chair? Yes. And that was going to be the end of the spot? Yes. But then I saw the plastic chair. I was like, if I hit the seat of the plastic chair, this bat's going to go through it. Yeah. So I was like, in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm going to hit the top of the chair and try to get to, like, flip out of the way. Because I was supposed to injure his ribs. So, like, as I went down... He moved. I moved a little bit. And I just, if you, people think I just directly hit his face. They don't realize yeah, I clipped the off. top and it, it ricocheted off. But like, you know what? Like I, I like to feel like I was one of the last guys brought up in the kind of old school, like way of like training and thinking instantaneously. I was like, we need to make money off this. And Eddie's the same way. Yeah. One thing about me and Eddie, as much as we are different, we're very similar with like our outs outlooks on wrestling. Like, and I truly was able to make, the entire wrestling world hate me. I, I oh, people yeah. that I thought was my real friends like turn around and just hate me, and I realize, well, this motherfucker wasn't my friend at all. Not realizing that it's kayfabe. Yeah, or realize thinking what I say online is one hundred percent legit. Like, why would you say that? You're like setting a bad example for people. Like, come on, like it's pro wrestling. Yeah, it's pro wrestling. One day, our society is getting so cancel culture that one day it's going to be you can't say i hate you to someone in a wrestling match i hate you and they're like, nope can't say that have you ever seen uh demolition man yeah. with wesley snipes yeah. and, uh and sylvester Stallone? that's what we're becoming we, <laughs> we are i we're, they're, they're gonna have tickets that come out it's like it's like oh this person's an idiot beep, beep. oh how dare you offend somebody minus eight credits <laughs> go back and watch that movie it's terrifying that and have you ever seen idiocracy Yes, yeah. We're becoming that, too. Wow. Look at our president right now. He's a reality television star. Do you think, though, that maybe the pendulum has just swung really far this way, and then maybe it will start to correct I itself? I keep thinking that. I'm like, oh, this this can't go forever, because like, everyone's just like, oh, like I hate this term, do better. Like People want to be so hypercritical of a situation or of a person without knowing the facts yeah. of anything. And someone can just be like, oh, this, per like, it's even to the point of like now wrestling fans, like, oh, I, I thought the heat in this match was really lazy and it was cheap heat. Do better. Like, who are you to be the one to say that to us? Like, yeah. we risk our lives for you people. And we do this because we love it. Just like you guys. We're all wrestling fans at one point, And now we're doing it. And the wrestling fans right now are making it so hard to, like, want to continue to wrestle. That, that's why so many wrestlers are just deleting social media at this point. Like, the entire ACH situation, obviously, there, there's something going on in his head mm -hmm. that didn't need more people just piling it on, piling it on, piling right. it on, piling it on. People don't realize. They want to say, oh, you guys should have tougher skin. But then they were just regular human beings. And when every day you just see it piled on you, piled on you, piled on you, piled on you, one day that's going to make you crack and you're going to make you feel something that you shouldn't be feeling. How, is it, how could it possibly change or be corrected? I think people need to – one of my biggest things that I really – because, like, I don't like – being very confrontational in real life because I don't want to get my blood pressure up. I don't want to get mad. I like to be chill and just hang out. I'm a very amped up person, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, but 
one of the things is like I if, if you truly think about this, okay, so let's say we're arguing about something. Sure. Even though I know you're absolutely wrong, in your mind you think you're right. In everyone's arguments, they think they are right. Yeah. So you can't just be like, oh, this person's a shitty person because he doesn't think the same way as me. When well, his mind, he is right. Yeah. Everyone has their own opinions. And when we're supposed to, it's supposed to be, and especially in the United States, freedom of speech. It's a free country. I think right now is the, the worst time for free speech ever. Because let's say this person's a Republican and this person's a Democrat. If this person says something about the Democratic Party, all oh, their piece of shit, they should die. Like, let's get the pitchforks or vice versa. Or it could be anything. I could say, I like the color red. So I'll be like, oh, you don't like the color blue? Oh, how dare you not like the color blue? Like, yeah. you are crucified for your opinions now. Yeah. Uh, Everyone's like, looking at things through their own lens. Yes. And through the only their, the experience that they've had throughout their life. And it's what's so interesting. But that is, makes people judgmental now. You can't. You yeah. can't, like, you can't. In, in today's society, if you were a Republican, I'm a Democrat. And you wore a Magna hat, and I'm so out in public with you, I'm a piece of shit for being around this person. But they don't know why this person's wearing this hat or anything else. Yeah. Like, you, you can't have your own opinions now about anything. Yeah. Like, why can't we all just get along and work towards common good, but still have our own opinions? It's like, oh, you like Trump? That's cool, man. Like, that's on you. Like, that's that's your. I don't think that should be like starting fights and stuff or or anything else. You see, yeah, people getting attacked in the streets for wearing MAGA hats. You see, people getting attacked in the streets. On, on the other hand, for like having a different, like everyone should be able to have their own opinion, and like even if it's not correct. In their mind, it is correct, and we need to realize that. That like we need to be nicer to people. I feel uh, because now, like we're we're in such as things like oh, you shouldn't say bully people, you shouldn't say this. But right now, people's bullying people more than ever before, especially online. Yeah, like there's yeah. there's people that's committed suicide because people's like saw something about them online and they just like oh, this is a terrible person. You should die. You should die. You should die. After the Eddie Edwards situation, like this is supposed to be professional wrestling. It's supposed to be fun. You know how many people I've had hit, hit me up is like Sammy Callahan. We hope you get hurt for real. And I, you hope you fucking break your leg in the in the wow. ring and you can't ever wrestle again. Like that's what people have become. Like, wow. Do people still talk about the Eddie Edwards thing to you? All the time. Really? Yes. That was like two years ago. Yeah. Still gets brought up. Just the fact that, like, are they going, man, I can't believe that happened? Or is like, you know, I hate It's either one that. of two things. Any t legitimately, anytime there's an accident in wrestling now, it's like so on post that clip, it's not as bad as Sammy Callahan. Or they're like, people's all mad that this person did this. Like, oh, how dare they? He's like, oh, no one was this mad when Sammy did it. Or it's like, or it's the opposite. It's like, someone gets kicked in the face and breaks their face. And it's like, oh, accidents happen. And then people post the clip. It's like, oh, you guys weren't saying that when Sammy Callahan did it. Like, it divides people. Yeah. Or it's people still brought up like, I, I win the world championship. And people's like, you're still a piece of shit. You heard Eddie Edwards. <laughs> What was the reaction for you when you after you won the championship? I thought it was see, I am a weird person, like we said. I don't have <laughs> any in between. I'm either people love me or hate me. But the people that love me love me. Uh, I, I've been lucky enough. I have a huge cult following. Oh yeah. Because I'm one of the rare guys, like I connect different races and ethnicities. Because I feel like I'm a person, like, I'm not supposed to be a guy on top. I am not your average professional wrestler. I'm not Brian Cage. I'm not, oh, he's the chosen one. I've had to scratch and claw for everything I've ever had. And I think people see that at the end yeah. of the day. People realize, like, oh, dude, this is this is the, I, Sammy's like the king of the oddballs, like the the oddities, the weird people, the people that was told, no, the people that was told, you'll never be good enough, you're never big enough. Like, I took that and I shoved it up society's ass. Yeah. And I become one of the top professional wrestlers on the planet. And, and so people see something in you that they see in themselves. Absolutely. You know, and I go, think that's why I, when I connect with someone, I truly connect with somebody. So I, when you beat Cage and won the championship, what was the general consensus? It was, I thought it would be way more negative than it was, but it was <laughs> extremely positive. Like even in the arena that night, like the fans had completely turned. Like everyone was like, it was a great ever, match. Everyone wanted me to win. And then when I won, it was like even like because there was moments where they thought Brian was going to retain and they were getting mad. And then like the matches continued to go on and on and on and on and on. And it ended up like being a huge reaction, one of the biggest reactions of the year at an impact show. And then online, I think I had like at one point, like me winning the belt, had like 1500 retweets just for the picture of like Sammy Callahan wins the belt. And for the majority, it was like positive. But there's still going to be those trolls online right. that wants to bring everyone down. But that's anything in life now. 
Like, I saw someone trashing Scott Pilgrim vs. the World the other day, which I love that movie. Great movie. And a lot of other people do. But the person was like, if anyone watches this, they're a child. This is idiot. Like, why can't people like Scott Pilgrim? It's a great movie. Well, not everybody's going to like everything. And I, I guess that that's what it boils down to, unfortunately. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you need to hate on someone for liking something. That's that's the problem. Yeah. If it you like the color red, I like the color blue. Fuck you. <laughs> that's that's how it is. Like well, and, and unfortunately, that's how it is in, in and wrestling. Everyone, like, and so many people right now use the crutch of uh, I have mental health issues. Everyone has mental health issues. I'm starting to realize that you get trapped in your own brain and you think like I'm the only one that feels like this. Why do I feel like this? Does right. other people feel like this? And then like, and people are too afraid to like talk to people and let it out and be like, yo, I feel the same way. Like you'd be feeling terrible right now and in, in your own mind by having this conversation like, oh, I, I have a real bad depression, but Sammy's sitting over here. He's tough. But like in my mind, I have a mental issue that someone else does. I think we need to get out and like support people better with that. It's like, and talk to us like, dude, I'm feeling the same thing. Like sure. we, we, we all feel the same thing. And I think yeah. that's one of the biggest problems with things. And I feel like this is going to be like a time that we look back on in 20, 30, 40, 50 years and go, you know, around the twenties, it's so weird to call it the twenties, but around yeah. this time, people started being more vocal about it. People started yeah. going, Oh, you're dealing with something? No way. I'm dealing with the same type of thing. Or we'll go the complete opposite in twenty years, like I said, we'll end up like Demolition Man, where everyone's you can't say anything, we're completely censored because everyone's offended by everything. Like, sure we all should have thicker skin at the end of the day. Like not everything can be offensive. People right. find something offensive about everything. So I want to watch a Disney cartoon and be offended oh, about course. something. But like, we can't just be offended about everything uh, because it's it, just because you're offended, you're offended personally, doesn't mean that what offended you should offend you. Yeah. Like, that, that you, people take things out of context, they take everything. Like, you got to realize that at the end of the day. Just because something's offensive doesn't mean it's truly offensive. And you need to realize your head is like, am I just being offended yeah. for the sake of being offended at this point? Yeah. I feel like people were sitting on both sides of the aisle for this with your match with Tessa. Yeah. I think a lot of people were excited to see her win, and then a lot of people were going, she doesn't deserve to be a champion. Yeah. Did you receive any backlash from 100%. that match? I had. Hell, Booker T put, oh, that kid ruined his career. He lost to a woman. Like, it's, 20, it's 2020. Like, in the world of professional wrestling, I feel like we should be like Game of Thrones and less like, oh, like, for anyone to say ever in professional wrestling, I hate that term, especially the Cornette fans, this isn't wrestling. Mm. Why isn't it? Undertaker struck a man with a lightning bolt. Kane shot a man with a fireball. A giant fucking turkey hatched out of an egg on Thanksgiving and wrestled. <laughs> like, pro wrestling is supposed to be fun. Like, yeah, Mae Young gave birth to a hand. Exactly. And I'm not saying these things were great, but at the same point, like, there's so many people saying, I hate the term, this isn't wrestling. You know why? Because everything's wrestling. Wrestling truly is for everyone. And just because you don't like a certain style doesn't mean it's wrong. Mm. Just because you hate a certain style doesn't mean it's wrong. You can like any style. You can like any style. See, I like my pro wrestling as I don't like just any one style. I like my wrestling as a wrestling buffet. I like a little bit of hardcore, a little bit of comedy, a little bit of uh, catch as catch scan, uh, British style. I like a little bit of hard hitting. I like a little bit. I don't want one entire show of like all technical matches right. or all super indie high flying matches or all freaking like MMA style matches. I'm right. the type of guy who's like, I want to open, I want the show to open. I think you see it as how I book wrestling revolver. My opening match is always like eight to 10 minutes sprint, like go out and kill it right off the bat. Like, I don't care. Like just kill it. And like no dead time, just action because people came to see wrestling. Right. Let's give them wrestling. It sets the tone. And then my second match, I'll bring it down a little bit. I have a comedy match or like a, a little bit of like, maybe my, not my top guys on the car just to like let them chill for a minute and just be have fun mm -hmm. like it's like okay this match i just got burned out kind of from this first match let's have fun then my third match will be kind of be like a storyline match that gets people like okay like this is a storyline and then usually the fourth match right before intermission will be like a hardcore match so it likes people like oh like, all this crazy yeah. shit just happened we gotta go to intermission and clean it up then we clean up we come back with something that's usually like one of our top storyline matches to get people to come back and sit down and like it's a slower build mm -hmm. so like everyone get their thing and then Towards the end, once everyone sits down, it starts killing it. And then the last three matches are just your your three biggest, like, let's knock it out of the park and finish yeah. it off. Right. Do you feel like your title run should have been longer? I don't know. 
because my title run would have been like because everything happens for a reason like sure, sure i would have liked to have a longer title run but who's to say i'm not going to win it back like right. who's to say i'm not like it's one small piece of me like i've won championships all over the world like sure this is a big gratification that i wanted uh but if let's say this like everything happens for a reason if i wouldn't have lost the belt would i have had the chance to do this new character true like or every, you wouldn't you wouldn't have been able to do it when you did it. Yeah. Or I may have never like had the balls to pull the trigger on it. Yeah. Might have been like, oh well what I'm doing's obviously working. Yeah, but that's like, that's true too. But I get bored of the same thing. Like I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions of me is that I'm very spontaneous and I'm very out there and like you never know what I'm gonna do. No, I am a very thought out person. Everything from like me spitting in a match is thought out. Because, uh, like a lot of people might hate that. But that's what I want people to, to hate me. Like, and there's a certain reason I do that because like I think the most gross people ever would spit on people, and which is funny because I'm a huge germaphobe in real life. And after <laughs> every match, I come to the back like, what I do, what I do. Oh, I'm so <laughs> fucking nasty. <laughs> were were you? Was the original plan for you to win the championship off of Brian Cage, or was it for Tessa to win it off Cage? And like then you. I go honestly to don't know. Like. In wrestling, everything changes always. Like, people don't realize, especially on television, like, things get rewritten up. Like, it's like, oh, we have this idea. And then things will change up until right before you go through the current, especially on, like, Raw or, like, something that's live every Monday night. Like, there's, a, I, there's times where they'll be there and it's like, okay, we have this show. And then it's like, you're wrestling this person. And then four minutes later, someone goes, you're wrestling this person. Yeah. And five minutes later, it's like, the show just started. They're like, you're, you're wrestling the big show now. It's like, Big Show's not even here. And then he walks in the door. And like, that's how much wrestling can change. But I kind of like, I like that pressure. Like, some people aren't good with it. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I need to be told, what are we doing? Like, this is bullshit. Why is it anyone? Like, we're, we're the stars. No one tells. I like to be on the edge of my seat because that, that's, then I can paint a different picture. It's like, oh, shit. Like, my, my 15 minute match got cut to two. <laughs> how can we do this? Let's do this. Do you not think that you have a better match when you've been able to plan it out with someone versus I think just... it's situational. Okay. I've had some of my best matches in my career. Like for instance, when I was younger, there was this wrestler named Devin Moore that I had just met at the time. I didn't even really know him. I had just moved to Philadelphia and we were going to a show up in New York, uh, in Queens. And it was like, so only supposed to be like two and a half hour drive. We got stuck in traffic forever. We were the opening match on the show. The show starts at eight o'clock. We got that at seven fifty, wow. And the guy says, you guys are still opening. And I was like, oh, shit. And then we went out and we fucking had a barn burner. Like, there's situations like, I believe anyone in the wrestling business shouldn't just learn one style. Of like, oh, I got to call everything in the back. Or, oh, I got to tell this story. I believe professional wrestling, you should know every kind of style. Like, And I, I, I pride myself on being one of the most versatile wrestlers on the planet. Because I can wrestle Japanese Dragon Gate guys and have those crazy, mm. like, super fast, like, no-stop match. Then I can wrestle someone like... Uh, Nick Gage and have a death match and tell a different story. And then I could wrestle Jerry the King Lawler in Memphis and have that style of match. And then I could wrestle Pentagon in Phoenix and have that style of match. Like I like to be able to have different styles of match wherever I go because it yeah. keeps me from getting bored. Like even if you look at my career, uh, when I first debuted in wrestling, like I have no inkling of doing one to do death matches. Like I was like, I'm yeah. a wrestler. I'm a wrestler. I want to be like a cruiserweight wrestler. I'm, I'm cool with that. And then I was like, Oh, I, I, I want to get over this new, this CZW era. So I was like, I'll do a couple death matches. People thought I was more of a death. I only did in my life, maybe 10 death matches. Yeah. People, people think, think you're a more. death match guy, I guess, cause of your time in CZW. Yeah. But I only did like 10 death matches, but the ones I did was really crazy. There were, and the only reason I did death matches is cause I'm like, okay, I am a tiny white kid that, I just look like a kid. Like I have to do something to have this aura and make people afraid of me or make myself special. So I did death matches for a small amount of time to show people like, Oh, this dude's fucking crazy. Like well, he, he'll do anything. And then from there that transcribed is I went back to like, I got like the dope ass Taz singlet made. And then my goal is like, okay, now I'm going to switch people. They, now they think I'm a death match wrestler. I want to make everyone believe I'm like one of the, best wrestlers on the planet and then i had all those matches with finley and i did all that and then everyone was like oh he's one of the best technical wrestlers on the planet strong style yeah and then like when i got back from wwe i was like i'm gonna like go out and show people that i'm one of the best wrestlers again and i fucking killed it and then after that i got bored of that i was like i'm gonna go fucking make people think i'm a wild man that's why i started wearing a fucking cat mask and being a space cat like i wanted people to think that oh he left wwe and he's obviously on drugs and he's lost his mind like 
So then I could turn that into something else. Like everything happens for a reason. Well, I think when you call yourself the death machine, yeah. people maybe can misconstrue that and go, oh, he likes death matches then. I don't even like death metal. <laughs> well, why are you the death machine? It just sounds good. Because I am the death machine. The, the machine of death. The death oh, machine. Oh. The machine of death. I am the machine. Where we go? I don't know. <laughs> if everything happens for a reason... And I truly believe that, too. We talked in our last interview, which was, what, three? I think my nipple was almost out just now. Nip slip? Yeah. I, should I show one, too? I'm losing weight again. This shirt's way too big. Uh, if everything happens for a reason, our last interview that we did, <laughs> what's going on here? You said that you became a bitch in WWE. Yeah, and at this point, like, I, I'm so sick of talking about this. Like, I, I, I've said the same thing so many times. Like, in WWE, I went in and tried to be, I was, I was like, oh, they don't sign guys like me very often. Mm -hmm. I, I need to do everything they tell me to do. And yeah. I did everything to a T. I was a model citizen there. To the point when I quit, they were like, you did everything right. And I was like, well, I did everything right. Then why the fuck am I not doing shit? Uh, yeah, I had to leave because I, dude, just going into work every day was like, you're looking over your shoulder. Like, it's that kind of feeling. Like, everything, you overthink everything. It's like, Bill DeMont's like, hey, man, how you doing? And then you're like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean? And, like, you, then you just start like, oh, this person's trying to get me. This person, And you become so paranoid and you become such a lack of a person that it's just like, dude, I had to leave. And it was the best thing I ever did. So when you, you've asked for your release and they granted it to you. Yes. That doesn't happen very often anymore. Well, I left on very good terms. Like, I told them why I wanted to leave. And I remember Canyon Seaman trying to get me to stay. He's like, yo, man, like, we don't hire guys like you very often. And I was like, and I remember that was the last thing. Because they had almost talked me to stay because I was supposed to be insanity. I was supposed to be, Eric Young ended up taking my spot in sanity. Because it was supposed to be me, Madman Fulton, and there was this big French dude named Marcus Louis. Uh, and I was like, it just kept getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And I was like, I'm so done with this. And they're trying to get me to stay. And when Kanye had said that, I was like, I'm going to leave. And then they tried to get me to be, they are like, okay, well, we don't want you working anywhere for 30 days. We want to make sure you're okay with money. So, like, we'll pay you for 30 days. And I was like, I don't want your money. Mm. And they're like, what? I was like, yeah, I'm showing up at a show in two days. I'm showing up. Because I think one of the biggest problems when some people leave a, uh, WWE, they take that 30-day or 90-day to collect a paycheck, and they just sit at home, and they lose all their buzz. Yes. So I was very smart is it leaked online that I quit WWE on a Wednesday, and then that Friday I showed up unannounced at AAW in Chicago. And then that Saturday I showed up at 2CW in fucking New York. This is smart. And the money I would have made that week in WWE, I made like three times that from just doing two indie shows and coming back. And that was a, like that made if I would have waited, I would not be where I am. That's that's a really interesting. That's a really interesting way to look at it, because yeah. I think a lot of guys go you had to roll the dice. It's like I'm already quitting WWE. Like I need to roll the dice. Even if I'm quitting, like I'm going. Full yeah, board. you're betting on yourself. Yeah. As we as we sit here in a casino. How interesting is that? Yeah. Fucking casino last night, mate. Oh, yeah, what happened? Dude, I was up like five, six hundred dollars between Blackjack and Texas Hold'em. And I was like, you know what? I'm doing good. I'm going to bed. I'm going to go to bed. And then fucking peer pressure. One friend's like, oh, you can't go to bed right now. Like, have a drink with me. I was like, I don't want to drink. He's like, you're a bitch. Like, I bet you won't put all your money down on red right now. And I was just like, I don't like being dared. Like, so I just, Oh, no. So you took all your winnings. Yeah. And put it on red. Hit black. As the oh. famous CZW group Blackout said, you always bet on black. Yeah. Sorry about that. There's always tonight, though. Yeah. No? No more betting know. tonight? I don't know. Rob Van Dam's having a big party tonight. He is? So I could do that. He's launching his CBD line. Oh. He's, like, la launching a national CBD line that's pretty cool. So everyone should check that out. Like, Yeah. Yeah. Rob Van Dam is... I'm a big proponent of CBD. I think it is... It's it's kind of a miracle for some people. Like, uh, I have really bad anxiety problems that don't people don't realize. And I refuse to take antidepressants because uh, in my mind, I'm like, they're going to make me suicidal or they're going to make me something because... My, my, I remember my dad at one point got put on antidepressants when I was younger. And like two days into it, he's like, oh, I feel really bad. Like I have bad thoughts. So he quit taking it. Same thing with my brother. My brother gets back from the military, serving over in Afghanistan and Iraq. And he comes back and he has PTSD. I'm like, oh, we, we want to put you on this. And he said the first day he like had 
bad thought. So like, I'm a big pro. Like, I don't like taking pills. I am not a pill guy at all because right. I see how easy it is to get addicted to pills, and I don't want to be that person. Like, because that's I grew up around that. Like, I'm not saying my family, but like, just where I grew up in Ohio, there was an epidemic of pills. Like, just sure. everywhere. I'm like, and I see how easy it is to get addicted to that. So, what do you think is the biggest misconception about Sammy Callahan? That I'm just a real life piece of shit. That I don't have any feelings. That I'm just out for myself and I'm selfish. Uh, there's a lot more to me than meets the eye. I'm a robot in disguise. Or <laughs> <laughs> transformer. Because, you know, like you said, there, people either love you or they despise you. Yeah. Which I think is a testament to how good your work is in the ring. It feels good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't like people to know my personal life. Like, people don't. And that's one of the biggest problems I think with society right now too. Hell, we put exactly what we eat, what we do. Like, we're giving the government, and and I'm not this big government conspiracy person, but we're giving the government the entire world. Like, we're letting them keep complete track of us. Like everything we're doing from, well, it, dude, it makes me so mad. Like, I will legit be like, oh, we should maybe go get McDonald's, and I open my Twitter, and like McDonald's just comes up. Like, oh yeah, they're listening to us. Like 100. percent you said that you don't like to put your personal life out there, but you mentioned earlier that you and Jessica have, yeah. have been dating for eight years. Where'd you guys meet? We actually met through, uh, we had like knew each other for years through other people. And then uh, we had just randomly ran into each other at a show and just instantly clicked. Like absolute best friend, video game nerd. Like me and her, like we're not the type of people, oh, let's go out tonight. Like we're like, yo, let's get a case of beer and play Resident Evil for four hours. Like she's my best friend, man. She's the only thing that keeps me sane. But like, we don't talk about our relationship. We don't put it out there that often because we both have our own careers and we don't want like just the type of person. She'll never take anything. If I ever try to do it for her, she's like, no, like I don't need you. My, I already had a career before we were together. Like just cause you're in this spot doesn't mean I need your help. Like, and she's very like, like, yeah. like that, like she wants everything to be because of her, not because of somebody else. Well, she's incredibly talented. Yeah, she's in awesome. Own, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you, You've had matches with her. Yeah. We're actually getting ready to wrestle uh, here in a couple weeks for my company, The Wrestling Revolver. Check it out. Cheap plug. At PW Revolver on social media. Website, ProWrestlingRevolver.com. You can watch all our shows on the High Spot Network. Wow. I didn't realize we were going to get a promo out of this. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> da, 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 da. I'm loving it. That's McDonald's. Uh, it's going to be on our phones now. If I, I swear, <laughs> it's like, all of a sudden this just turns into a McDonald's logo. <laughs> Run! We talked about some of the other controversial moments, but one of the ones I, I think I was always just kind of unsure about is this one where you got kicked out of a show and then the security's kicking you out for real. You thought it was part of uh, the show. That you was know. real, but then became, it's funny because that security guard and me are actually really good friends now. Uh, so it was at AAW. Yeah. I was having a street fight with Jimmy Jacobs. This was all the first all in weekend in Chicago. And we had this match and we were brawling through the crowd and uh, we were like fighting on these chairs. And for some reason, the building got on the mic and then goes, hey, guys. Quit being assholes and using our chairs, even though we hadn't broke a chair yet. We hadn't. We were just standing on them, but they thought we were breaking them. Okay. And then that obviously makes me and Jimmy mad as hell because, like, why would this fucking building? Because then all the crowd does the entire match goes, chairs, 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 <laughs> chairs. So we do all that shit. So then uh, we, we brought these chairs in the ring because we needed them for the finish. We were, like, putting, we're going to break the chairs. We're just using it to hold up the board. And they came in, like, we're getting, and they pulled the chairs out of the ring. So then they like the crowd gets mad at that. It was like, oh, chairs, chairs, chairs. So we just finished the match. And then I rolled to the outside. And there's like these security guards on the outside of the ring. And I thought they were like suit, like wrestling security, just like wrestling security, like always. And I, I'm always pushing down security guards and stuff. It's like I just lost. I'm like, oh, get out of my way. Like I'm mad. And I push this guy. And he turns around. He grabs me. And that instantly makes me mad. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. And he's like, he's like, you need to get out of here right now. And I was like, I ain't getting out of shit. I'm the champion. And like me and him getting a tussle and he keeps trying to like grab me. I'm like, don't touch me, dude. Don't touch me. And then freaking all of a sudden he goes and shows me his gun. Oh my God. And I was like, and I always thought I'd be a person. If I saw a gun like in real life about to shoot me, I'm going to run. But obviously that's not how my brain thinks. I look at him. I go, are you going to fucking shoot me in front of all these people? You're going to shoot me. 
you're going to shoot me. Really? And then, like, Jess and Dave and Jake come out. I was like, dude, you need to get to the fucking back. You're going to get shot by this security guard. And then, like, we got into this big knockdown drag out argument in the back. I was like, dude, the fact that you have a gun in a wrestling show is fucking stupid. And then, like, he's actually, like, an off-duty cop, <laughs> which made it that much oh. worse. I was like, damn it, I picked the wrong person to push tonight. And then you said you guys are friends Yeah, now. we became friends. I wow. bought him a drink that night, and then every time we show, he's like, you getting crazy tonight? You getting, you getting crazy? <laughs> I'm super excited to see, you know. I'm going to write a book one day. I have a lot of crazy stories. Oh, yeah. We've barely scratched the surface. Oh, yeah. I know. I like scratch-offs. You scratch-off guy? Yeah, a little Rides bit. Me and my parents. I, I, I actually got a scratch-off for Christmas. I was very excited. Scratch, 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 scratch. Scratch, scratch, scratch. I won. How much? Two dollars. Uh, Woo! Little things like that. Promoters just going above and beyond for wrestlers makes them want to be there. It creates that family atmosphere. There's a company that's ran by Randy up in Maine called Limitless. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I've heard of it. But like his whole thing is every time that he pays you, he puts a scratch-off ticket in your envelope. And then, like, it's just like an extra, like, oh, thank you. And so he's like, oh, scratch yeah. off ticket. And I've seen people win like $1,000 on scratch off. So it's like, damn, like, because yeah. you bought me the scratch off. Like, that's not a bad indie payday. Yeah. yeah, that's a good promoter. Yeah. Yeah. You should start doing that at Wrestling Revolver. I've debated it. I really have. I've thought about that a lot now. Because it's only going to cost, I mean, scratch off tickets are what, a dollar, two dollars? Yeah, it depends. Right. You get crazy, get the $20 ones. Oh, that is crazy. Yeah. Why don't you could start paying your guys in just scratch offs? It's like, okay, you get your fee or you get $150 over scratch offs. Ooh, everyone's going to take the fee. Yeah, 100%. The, yeah. Oh, so you gave See, me. See, I might risk that. I'm going to go, give me the fucking scratch Give me like half the fee yeah. and then like half scratch off. Scratch off. Because this could turn into $5,000 or something. So I'm sorry, dude. I know this is your show, but we got to cut this. Yeah. I was. I, was, I got to go to a television right. I was on my way to wrapping this up. So we're, we're just scratching the surface of your character here. Uh, but I'm super excited no, to see. You don't leave me hanging, bro. Sorry. Okay. I'm, Gosh, you made me so mad just now. I'm I'm excited to see you know what you continue to do with this in this year and continue on because you just keep reinventing yourself. I'm excited to see what you're going to do this year and in the future. Well, thank you. I know. It's, it's only February. I, you got you got flags. I have like flag. the fact that you know what these are called really impresses me. Yeah, I'm about to launch my own YouTube channel and stuff. Well, people can look out for it's that. It's called Gimmick Soup. Gimmick soup, everyone. It might be launched by the time people see this. We've been filming and writing for it for the last, like, six months. Oh, nice. Yeah, we're going in. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. And we'll wrap things up. You look great. The Chris Filet Show. <laughs> Thank you. I look like I'm superimposed in. It yeah, kind of. What a fascinating guy. What a great conversation, as always, with Sammy Callahan. Thank you for being a part of it. What do you think of his new gimmick? We actually had to sit on this interview for a little while, which is why this is an in-person interview from back in the day when we used to be able to do these interviews in person. But his new gimmick hadn't yet debuted on TV, so we were sitting on this and waiting for his new gimmick to be on TV before we would talk about it publicly. But now it's out there, so let me know what you think of this new gimmick. He says this is them doing that gimmick right. And I happen to agree with him. So let me know in the comments what you think about that. But I just love the way his mind works when it comes to wrestling and how he's constantly reinventing himself a la Jericho, like he said, being inspired by Chris Jericho, who was inspired by David Bowie. So if Sammy Callahan's along that same path, oh man, we got a bunch of good stuff to come from him. Thank you again to Grail for sponsoring the video. Check out the link below in the description. You will not be disappointed with that. So the interviews do not stop. Wrestling does not stop. They just won't be interviews in person like this one. So we're going to be doing some more virtual interviews like the one we did with Mike Rome and the live Q&As that we did last week. Let me know who we should have a virtual interview with next. Hmm. Who should it be?